Hi everyone, I'm Josh. Welcome back to my channel today. It's my October wrap-up. So these are all the few books that I read in October. Actually, October was not too bad. I want to say I got seven or eight books read. My goal was ten. I had several that I could have almost finished, but my cruise, I, I read some of the cruise that I had this month, this last month. It was that was I think I think it was a good accomplishment to read some of the cruise. But then traveling with me with my family, closing out the month wasn't as great. Well, it is what it is, right? Without further ado, these are the books that I read for Halloween. The only theme I really went around about this month was to try and stick to horror slash thriller slash mystery, you know, stick to the Halloween vibes. I did read a couple books that fit into the Black Awena Thon classification. In fact, I have three specifically that I read. Two of them I think I picked up consciously thinking I want to read more for the Black Athon Readathon or the Black Awena Thon. So I guess I'll start with those. Why not? First one is Living Blood, African Immortals 2.0, the second book in the series by Tanareeb Du. This book, I think I gave four, no, three and a half to four stars, but closer to four stars. This was the second in this uh, quad quadrology, this series, about these vampire-like creatures who are more, not quite angel angels. I don't want to spoil the first book. Part of the, the story is the revelation of what they are. But what I, uh, how do I say this? I can't really talk about my problems with a book without digging into where the story is going. I'll put it this way. There are a lot of similarities between this book. I say similarities. There are tangential ideas explored in this book as there are in Midnight Mass, the vampire story created by Mike Flanagan on Netflix. They basically present two different ways to approach vampires from a religious perspective. And I don't love how this story does it. I just, this story at the root of it is it reads almost like Christian myth, Christian fiction, and I say that as someone who was raised very Christian, who read, who gen genuinely read Christian fiction, and I don't know if that's necessarily what this is. It's just our characters being Christian, and it's a fundamental part of the story. And for me, though, I'm just not here for it. Like I, I really like the story in a lot of ways, but I can't get past the fact that it feels as if I'm reading a book that's all about worshiping God and at the end of the day God will win because God always wins and God is pure and oh, seemingly good and that's a really harsh critique for this book and I don't know if it's entirely fair because it's not this book is objectively like just proselytizing too because it's, it's really not it's it's for the most part a solid book that is a is separated from from the religion but just the religion is a core principle of of the story and for me I just can't remove that and as someone who has so much religious trauma and who is so deep in that, I just, I can't remove the fact that for me, it just takes away from the story. I also think it sort of takes away some of the stakes when I, we just have this unending faith that God is good and pure and can we, in the end, God will win out. It just disappoints me coming from what I feel like is, is usually a very, I don't want to say scary, but Tenerife dude tends to have very dark approaches to story. She's not afraid to go dark, is what I'm trying to say. And that gives some real weight to her stories in addition to the other types of emotional weight that exist because of the themes that are explored in a lot of her stories. But for me, it just takes away from it. That said, coming to this book without rereading the first one, I, I remembered very little, but this book was still really effective at getting me to care about our characters, reminding me who's who. I was a little lost at first, but I started to pick up where we're at and who these characters were. Part of it was that we were introduced to new characters. Uh, and I think that was, I think it really speaks very highly to Karen Reeve Dew into this book, that it was able to pull me in despite my utter lack of knowledge of the first book, if we're being honest. So from that perspective, it's it's a really effective book, which is why like I'm, I'm hesitant to say it's a bad book because it's really not. It's just the religious component just doesn't work for me and it, it does hurt the book in my experience reading it. But aside from that, it's a solid book and a really a, a really exciting one for the most part. And I'm excited to, I'm eager rather, to, to continue the series eventually. Okay, next up, I'll go with <laughs> While Justice Sleeps by Stacey Abrams, <clears throat> who I voted for and absolutely adore. And, and it sucks that she didn't win. It was kind of foreshadowed by the, the polls. She was not as close this time as last time. That's not really the point of this video, is it? I just irked at Georgia for being the way they are. You know, Warren Walker may not be in the office and he may not inevitably get there, but you know, a huge chunk of Georgia were happy to put a domestic abuser and fucking hypocrite in the office. And it's just it's next to a actual reverend. It's just the level of hypocrisy. Sorry, I am so sorry. <laughs> 
not the point. Okay, this book is a political thriller, <clears throat> and it's kind of a mystery. It follows the what's the what are the word for them? The people who who are aides, the, the aide to a Supreme Court justice who falls ill. He basically falls into a coma, and what follows is this political thriller to try and figure out what happened to him because it's some kind of potential scheme that may have been trying to kill him by from some political group who's trying to get the Supreme Court to make a certain decision in an upcoming case that relates to it. The problem I have with this book, the problems, I should say, like I, I was really into it at first. I was really invested. I, I thought it was fun. I think she has a, a fun writing. Well, it's fun enough, I should say. But I felt like the story itself, the actual crafting of a narrative, I was the one I'm like, oh God. I, I love Stacey Abrams, but it just felt amateurish. Like I'm, I'm not an author, so, so, so take that as, as, as you will, but there was just certain things about it that just felt poorly executed, poorly thought out. Like the entire premise of the Supreme Court justice being, uh, trying to be incapacitated somehow. There were certain things about that that I, my understanding of the Supreme Court system, and how it works, it's like, you can do this, but things are still gonna move forward as this. Like, they, they don't want him to vote, okay, he's incapacitated, and that won't stop them from voting, it just means they will be lacking a, a th an extra vote. They're gonna take the vote, he won't be there to take it, and it's, and it's just gonna go the way it's gonna go. And there's other things to do with his own involvement with the case, and how he is so heavily involved, he would've, if he was, if this was the real world, he would've recused himself in the first place. And it's just little things like that that just break the world for me and I find it hard to believe. <sighs> what else? What else? Actually, I should just open the goddamn review because I, I wrote it all out. I had a lot of thoughts. I was just disappointed. And other parts, I guess, that, those are the two big things. I just felt like the mechanics weren't quite thought out. And I was honestly disappointed because she, she is a Congress, sorry, she is a politician. She's been in a state Congress. She, I'm sure she knows how the, how, how the Supreme Court works, so I just don't understand, unless I, I'm just fundamentally flawed in my way of thinking about the Supreme Court, why she couldn't have crafted a more realistic story. It's just, we have a series of things that don't make sense, people acting in a way that to me don't make sense. And to me, that fundamentally breaks the story. That That's really a problem with most mysteries. So maybe it's wrong of me to say it's amateurish because there are plenty of mainstream mystery authors who I think are amateurish. Yet y'all keep giving me goddamn money. The other thing is that like, I remember thinking, you know, this book might not be the best thing in the world, but at least she didn't do this. At least she didn't do this overused trope where suddenly things just get flipped on the head just because they happen to be two people in the same room of the opposite sex. I should just say, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Insta-love. And I'm like, this, oh, at least she didn't do this because you know, there's, there's just no foreshadowing beyond their existence in the same room together. And all of a sudden it just happens. And I'm like, oh my God, she did it. There's no way I can give this a, a firm four stars once she did that and it's just, I was disappointed. I, I think she makes a better politician. I think she's better suited for government. That's just my opinion. One thing I will say is the book had me engaged and it gave me a lot of thoughts, which is, is more than I can say to, it than a lot, to a lot of books, including this next one, which is the last book I read for the Blackathon, or sorry, Black Aweenathon. And that is Flowers for the Sea by Zen E. Rocklin. Uh, this was a book that didn't really work for me. I think I gave it three stars. It's based on an it's isolated island that has is isolated from the rest of the world. It's like its own unique culture. Uh, that is to say, like non-Western, and it follows this woman who gets pregnant and is forced to go through labor. And a big chunk of the story is just her going through labor, or first finding out she's pregnant, then going through labor, and it explores the dynamic of her the man who impregnated her and the people around her and the society. I think it explores some ideas around gender and that dynamic, but I struggled to follow and take the point to the point that it just felt like it didn't accomplish much for once I was finished it. I was disappointed because I honestly had high hopes. I don't know, I was looking for books that were um, black black horror writers that I hadn't found, hadn't heard of, or, or mysteries or thrillers. And this was marked as a horror thriller. And I, I, I can see that it definitely fits in the genre. I'm not saying that. It's just, I don't necessarily think it's that special, that great. Um, and I guess it explains why I hadn't heard anybody talk about it. It came out in 2021 of, la of October of last year. That's that, it was a novella. It was just fine. It was intriguing what it, what it was trying to do, what I think it was trying to do. It just didn't do much with what it gave, I guess. Next up, let's go and talk about The Star Sparman by Mary Robin Corral. That was a review I actually posted 
thankfully my first video in a month. This was a mystery by Mira Odekanwal about a murder mystery that occurs on a cruise in space. It's based around a, a previous story I haven't actually read or I don't remember the name of it, but the premise is just, you know, I have a murder mystery and it's happening on a cruise. It happens to be in space. So you have this inclusion of space terminology, space, a space setting basically, which gives us an opportunity to, to have this story in a unique milieu. It's a traditional story in a unique milieu. It gives Mary Robin Corral an opportunity to flex her muscles as a author who is really good about doing the work to flesh out a story in a way that is believable, um, immersive, but not uh, esoteric. And I think is that is the best thing about the story. I think I gave it uh, four stars, maybe four to four and a half stars, actually. It was, a, to me, a good, a good mystery thriller. It wasn't like way out there like a lot of mysteries or a lot of thrillers out there that feel the need to do this a huge twist but i thought it was a competent narrative that was believable with characters making believable decisions in this circumstance and that to me makes a really good book especially based off of some some of these other books i've talked about already you know what i'll go and talk about a dnf i had this month that was um what moves the dead this one was a dark fantasy i think i got, I got about 30 percent into it it's a novella i would think and i realized i was not connecting I do want to return to Convicting Fisher, and if I connect with their her other books, I will probably return to this one because I've heard good things about it. I just knew that with my state of reading, I could not afford to push through a book that I was not connecting with, so I DNF'd it. What else? The Hellbound Heart. That was one that I read because of the new movie that came out, which I loved. I don't know about the rest of y'all. I thought the, the movie was phenomenal. I really loved the Cenobites and the all the time it spent on the Cenobites. The beginning half of it was a little, the beginning chunk of it was a little slow. When I first watched, I didn't mind it, but for rewatching, knowing what's to come is a little bit of a slog personally. But it, I thought it was a solid take on, on, the, on the genre. I thought it was better than the original, but I think the original is actually pretty cheesy, if a fun book. And I the actual novella, I thought was good. I don't know why. Maybe I think I tried listening to it before and I didn't love the narrator. So I sort of gave up on it. But that was what would have been a while back. I, I don't, before my booktube channel. But this to me was solid. It was well crafted. It was dark, demonic, unnerving. And oh, I adored it. I just absolutely adored it. This one got a firm five stars from me. Uh, it would probably be on favorites of the year, if I'm being honest. Okay, let's talk about a couple of my Lovecraftian. I, my themes, I, I talked to y'all at the beginning, if y'all watched my TBR, my To Be Read, I had like themes per week and I, I managed usually one book, sometimes two, so I wasn't, I mean, I didn't do that great of a good job of, of tackling my themes. The themes did not help me read more, is what I'm trying to say. But I did read two Lovecraftian books. The first one, The Night Ocean. It might have been the second one. This is, oh my god, The Night Ocean wasn't good. That was, I wasn't happy with it. You got two stars, maybe two and a half. The Night Ocean is more of a historical fiction book. It follows this modern guy who is um, a journalist or a writer. He's investigating Lovecraft and relationship he had with uh, a younger man or more I honest, a teenager, a kid. And it turns out they were queer, at least in the fictional soy. And to me, I was not here for it. This book felt like it was an homage or a, or a love letter to Lovecraft more than his actual world. And that's just not something I can get behind. I don't get the obsession with him as a person considering he was a fucking horrible person. This does dissect that. Like we, it dissects Lovecraft as a racist asshole. But at the same time, we follow at one point the 17 year old boy's perspective and how he's trying to basically get with Lovecraft. And at one point we see him um, challenge Lovecraft and how um, it's like basically calls him out for his racist bullshit. But that doesn't stop him from still pursuing him because, of course, that's the peak of a privilege to, you know, saying you're a piece of shit, but I'll tolerate it if you can give me what I want. And in the, in the story, I think the character was actually Latinx, so I don't, don't think they were white. It was little things like that that just didn't work for me. And it was also, I guess, the it wasn't fantastical. Like, if, if there was speculate, speculative, I, I'm, I somehow blanked to it. It was <laughs> entirely a work to just reflect, to to, re to, to fantasize, or rather to create a, fi a fictional history of Lovecraft's life and stories about it. Like I get how people who love Lovecraft or a fan of his life could appreciate that, but for me it just didn't work. It just did not work. Then The Fisherman. The Fisherman was the other Lovecraft story that I read. This one was much better than um, The Night Ocean in a sense that it was an actual Lovecraftian speculative story, but it did have flaws. So the fisherman basically follows this 
man who's who loses his wife to cancer i believe it is they're older and he starts fishing to once after she's died to cope with her death it turns out that in this ocean in this sorry in this lake or something there is this history of this weird event happening these people coming these quote-unquote people coming back to life come out of the lake but they're a little bit different changed the fisherman is an amazing book I almost perfect in my estimation. I was really invested in our main character. The narrative was really well done. But about halfway into the story, we cut, maybe a third of the way in the story, we cut over into, we cut to a very extended flashback, which is essentially, they get into a diner, which is kind of, kind of a trope, but they get to a diner, this local tells them the story of, of what happened. And we basically get this entirely separate story that feeds into this one. There is, of course, a lot of imagery or, or similarities like the, the, the two go hand in hand they do they do they do relate to one another especially since this builds on to the stuff that's going to happen to the fishermen in this lake and we basically get this flashback of what happened and this turns out to be half the book like i was invested in it until i realized at some point it was never going to end and <clears throat> i think going into it a second time i might be able to appreciate it more knowing what to expect but if i'm being honest as a structural approach to the story I don't think it added to the book. I, I think we would have been better with an abridged to non-existent backstory of this background event before we see what's happening with our fisherman and uh, another friend he has in the story, which I won't get too deep into. Um, I think that would have stood on its own by itself. And then he could have given a companion novel or companion novella that is this flashback independent of that. And the two would have linked perfectly. But I don't think they work woven together like this it just didn't for me and i stand by that because the story the writing is phenomenal it's really engaging and engrossing in the story and I, I loved our main character which is why i fucking hated it when we switched over to some random newbies anyways that aside it was a solid book which is why it gets four to four and a half stars um despite how frustrating part of it the structure was for me and then lastly the last book that i read in october at least that i finished in october a house at the bottom of the lake by josh malaman I've been wanting to read this for years, if I'm being honest. I just wasn't, I could never find it to put on my shelf, so I never actually read it. But this year, this month, I let myself read some books that I was eager to read. I really liked it. I think, what was I expecting? I don't know. I guess it started out more, it started out as a love story, and I didn't realize that was what the case, the direction it was going. But it definitely got very unnerving and uncomfortable in a way that I thought was really good. My only complaint about this story really was the conclusion. I thought the ending was too too ambiguous for my taste like i usually am fine with amb ambiguity but for me it was more confusing than anything so i just couldn't get into it i think it was four to four and a half stars solidly un unnerving i was listening to this one on the cruise and i would go out in the front deck because we were on the 11th floor and basically the front deck was just for people on the 11th floor you could see the stars it was basically pitch black it was gorgeous i went out there almost every night i would just sit there or walk around and and listen look at the stars and at some point <laughs> it got to me. I was too unnerved being outside in the pitch black uh, under the light of the stars for the story. And I appreciate it for that. That's what, uh, that's what I want from a horror story. The basic idea is these <clears throat> these two teens that go for a date. I think they go canoeing on a lake or something. And at some point, they go off venturing and they find this side lake. And they see this house at the bottom of the lake. And the house is strange because it's, it's strangely pristine. And it almost seems like a like a ghost house and we basically see them return to it over and over again until weird things start to happen either at the house or at their home and it really builds really well i would love to see this as a movie i think it would make a phenomenal setting for a film but as a story it was really good and that any may have like messed it up a bit for me but other than that it pretty much met my expectations as a really good, unnerving read. It really makes me want to read more Josh Malaman. He's so popular that I kind of don't want to read him, but at the same time, it doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. Not everybody is going to be uh, Riley Sager. Just because they're popular doesn't mean they're objectively bad, even though that is the case with Riley Sager. Those are the books that I read. It honestly wasn't that bad. I felt like October wasn't a good month, but talking to you now, oh fuck, there was more. Was there more? Have I done my September wrap up? <laughs> I don't know if I have. I just realized there were books I didn't talk about that I thought about in October, but it was actually September. It doesn't matter. Those are good. It was a good, a decent reading month, considering I've been traveling. So that's that. Let me know what you read this month. And as always, have a great day. Stay safe, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.